Okay. So, <laughs> welcome everyone. I'm happy to see your faces and hear your voices. It's been a handful of months since the Freight Advisory Committee um, has met, and we're excited to share some updates and talk about the future of this committee with you all. Um, yeah. Next slide. So, um, over the last, I mean, I think we've been working on a long range transportation and freight plan for at, at least a couple of years and the, the makeup of this committee has adjusted a little bit. So I do want to take the time to go through who's here today. Um, we have a list on the screen of um, who we're proposing right now to to represent um, the state of Alaska on this committee and <clears throat> this the makeup of this could change. So if you're here, um, please. We'll go through the attendance list, introduce yourself, tell us who you're representing, and then we'll talk about um, if there's any adjustments to this list that need to happen. OK, so um, I'm going to I'll go through the list here. Um, and call on you to introduce yourself. Just say who you are and who you're representing. Um, we'll do the consultant team and DOT at the end. So we'll start with Brian. How many Brian's do you have? I think it's just you, the railroad yeah. one. Brian Lindemood, Alaska Railroad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. We'll go to John next. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, John Cecil with AMATS, and I'm the uh, freight uh, coordinator for the uh, uh, AMATS uh, Freight Advisory Committee. I haven't been a member of this committee, but I'm just trying to keep track of what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, and John, you're going to be, you and Aaron are going to be real, really helpful to us um, as the makeup of the AMATS Freight Committee might update and change. You can, you can help us with that. Certainly. Okay. Um, we'll go to Rebecca Douglas next. Good morning, Rebecca Douglas, uh, Alaska DOT, and I work in statewide aviation and manage the AIP program and the system plan. We'll go to Jody next. Good morning, Jody Gould. I'm the Alaska International Airport System Planner and represent Anchorage and Fairbanks. Okay. Emily, we'll go to you next. Are you talking to me, Emily Haynes? Yep, please. Sorry, Emily That's Haynes okay. with Federal Highways. The last okay. question. Okay, um, Julie, you are also, um, we have you as the representative on the, on the fact for Federal Highways. Is that, are you going to be the official representative? I am, yes. Emily's listening in, and we this all could change once we hire a new planner. So for now, it's me. Okay, cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, okay, Jackson, you're up. Yeah, Jackson Fox, Director of Fast Planning, uh, which is the state-designated metropolitan planning organization for Fairbanks and North Pole. Joe, we'll go to Joe Michelle next. Joe Michelle with the Alaska Trucking Association. Uh, not much more. I'm on AMATS, uh, working with John, and other than that, happy to be here. Okay, cool. Thank you. Aaron. Hey, everyone. I'm Aaron Yolgadilin. I'm the executive director of AMATS, um, Anchorage MPO. And can you please update the information on the screen here? I do not represent the municipality of Anchorage in these meetings. I am AMATS and John as well. Thank you. Yeah, our you. apologies. Good catch. Yeah, sorry about that. We know better. OK. Um, Catherine Keith next, please. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm just working through some of the uh, IT <laughs> issues. So um, it's Catherine Keith, Deputy Commissioner DOT. I'm here with Addison uh, Spafford. Um, hi, buddy. Uh, also with us here at DOT, so looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, Lee, go ahead. Hey, morning. I'm Lee Ryan with the Aviation Advisory Board. Um, 
board uh, appointed by Murkowski, I think in 06, and been uh, working as Robert and I think Abe's counterpart on the aviation side since then. Glad to be here. Thanks, Lee. Terry? Hello, Terry Linseth. Um, I am the Deputy Airport Director for the Ted Stevens Anchorage Airport, overseeing planning and development. I'm also on the AMATS Rate Advisory Committee. We'll go to Mike next. Uh, Mike Thrasher, Tote Maritime, Alaska. Steve. Hey, good morning. I'm Steve Rebuffo, the director at the Port of Alaska, and I guess in this context here, I, I could be the municipality of Anchorage's representative because uh, my point of view is to represent the owner of the port. Thanks, Steve. Um, Rich? So my name's Richard Heath. I'm the uh, business manager for UPS in Anchorage, Alaska, and I also sit on the AMATS Freedom Advisory Board. Thanks, Rich. Okay, and then we have, I'll go to Eric next. Go ahead. Can you introduce yourself, Eric? Uh, good morning, uh, Eric Taylor uh, with uh, Alaska DOT and our Planning and Program Development Division. Uh, I manage the uh, freight plan and the long-range transportation plan. Okay, and we'll go to James. Yeah, hi, good morning, everybody. James Marks. I'm the Director of Planning and Program Development at DOT. Um, and then from the huddle team today, you have myself, Holly Spoth-Torres. I've been supporting Kittleson through this whole project with stakeholder engagement. Um, I have my colleague Mandy Powers on the line, too, and she's going to be supporting us today as well. And then last but not least, I'll pass it to Wendy. Good morning, everyone. Wendy Wilbur with Kittleson and Associates, and we manage the development of the long range transportation plan and the freight plan. And before I go any further, I just want to make sure everyone knows that the freight plan was indeed approved by FHWA in December. So it is good to go. And as we move forward, we're I'm going to continue to work with the Freight Advisory Committee and kind of help identify roles, responsibilities, and next steps, which is a lot about what this meeting is about. So I'm sorry to back up just a little bit. I noticed there's one more phone number um, listed. The last four that are 3142. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, this is Bob Sherrill. I'm the Defense Logistics Agency and military rep on the uh, FAC. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I almost missed you there. Okay, so next slide, Wendy. Um, today, we're going to do four things. Um, Wendy's going to go an overview of the Alaska Freight Plan update. She already gave you a sneak peek. It's been adopted, right? Um, the next thing we're going to do is we'll have a short update on what you'll hear people call IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. You'll get an update on that. Um, we're going to start talking about, which is actually one of the recommendations in the freight plan, is the, um, the continuation of this committee for the long term. So the formation of a freight statewide advisory committee. We're going to start talking about what that might look like. And then we have a handful of up regional updates um, that other people are going to report out on briefly. So that's that's the goal of today. OK. Next slide. All right, so uh, we last spoke in September about the freight plan. We received comments from the public review period. We received comments from all of you and the statewide advisory committee. So we made some revisions on the freight plan and submitted that to FHWA. And they came back really with just about six comments, which I think is is pretty astounding. I feel I think the team can be pretty proud of that with all of your input. We did a really good job of capturing the freight movement and complexities. So what they asked us to go back and do was really comply with the new infrastructure grant, IIJA. So they had, um, when we started this freight plan, it was under the old rules. 
And then in January, new rules went to, into effect, but they hadn't adopted guidance for freight plans yet. So we really didn't know what needed to be included or not included until about August. So what we did is we took all of those new regulations based on FHWA's comments, and we just really had to kind of add some new actions and goals really around sustainability, very much a focus on sustainable freight transportation, carbon reduction strategies, zero, zero vehicle emissions, really reducing emissions across the board. Most of these goals were included in the long range transportation plan. So we either referenced back to them or we added some new ones for the trucking industry. But one of the recommended recommendations in the LRTP was a sustainable transportation team. So really we said, let's just put one of the freight representatives on that team, try not to create a lot of new committees. One thing that is really in the new regulations is identifying um, some baseline freight related emissions. But to be fair, most of the states were not ready to identify that number or set that target. That takes a little bit of work and study. And so we worked with FHWA and just said, we're going to identify that moving forward. But that's not really just an issue for the freight plan. That's a statewide issue, and that's a little bit bigger. So they agreed to the fact that this is just something that still needs to be done, and we know it's on our radar. The other piece was climate justice. Again, really focusing on freight projects in disadvantaged and transportation disadvantaged communities, overburdened communities. This is an important goal to leverage all of the grants that are out there as well. And so just a huge emphasis now on equity and environmental justice. And then finally, wildlife habitat and prote protection. And I'll be honest, I was like freight industry, wildlife and habitat protection. That was a little tricky. Uh, so what we said is we will support the wildlife action plans, the Ala uh, Alaska Fish and Games Wildlife Action Plan. They've got, you know, different measures in there. And that's, you know, mitigate wildlife habitat loss, pay attention to migration corridors, and reduce the spread of invasive species. So this was just something that has to be included in the plan. There's lots of environmental plans. We're just gonna build off what's already in place. So those were kind of the big changes. The other thing that we did, Joe, you'll be very happy about this, is we beefed up the parking uh, language in the plan. We had a, quite a bit in the technical appendices about truck parking, but we had to carry some of more of that forward into the actual plan. So any questions on the sustainability, climate, justice, and wildlife and habitat protection additions that you haven't seen before? Okay. We Go ahead, Joe. Joe just raised his hand. Yeah, Joe. Thank you. Uh, so we submitted a plan and th all these items were sent back in were put into the plan by the, the feds? Their requirements as part of the new I Infrastructure Jobs Act, correct. And that guidance had not come out until late. And we can talk about this offline, but uh, what governing body or, I mean, I I'm having trouble, like, have we identified communities or areas of communities that, you know, are eligible for some climate justice? There, so yeah, so the federal government has actually mapped disadvantaged communities, uh, transportation burden communities, and they're done by census tract, so it's based on census data. So there's what's called a Justice 40 map, and I can share the link, and it identifies those communities. What you're gonna see in Alaska is by default, we're pretty well covered and most projects are going to touch these. And uh, I guess, you know, for the, for the folks that wanna bang their heads against this, I mean, could I have the backup or the, just the reading material on all six of these items? I'd love to review the wild hat 
wildlife and habitat protection uh, plan that Fish and Game put out. And uh, it just seems like, yeah, just, I mean, as long as, as long as I have an opportunity to kind of read through these new changes, just so I can wrap my head around uh, the hoops that we have to jump through. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll get a copy of those plans. And really what these, there's additional work. So when you remember, if we go back to the family of plans that are identified and a lot of the detail for these will be just addressed in the more mode specific plans. So these are pretty general. And then each mode specific, whether you're rail, whether you're air, whether you're trucking, you'll have a little bit different slant on how you implement these. Okay, but I'll get you links to the Justice 40 map, to the plan. And a lot of these, you know, we're still waiting for the plans have to be developed. So it, it looks the sustainable freight transportation plan hasn't even been written. So that's an action that needs to happen. So these are all just kind of steps in preparation. All right, and then the other item we updated a bit was the freight investment plan in coordination with DOT based on feedback from this group and with feedback from FHWA. So the Dal both Dalton Highway projects and the Sterling Highway project already had NHFP funds allocated, the National Highway Freight Program Transportation Funds were already allocated. So we had to carry these projects forward. And so the numbers you see, those are not the total project costs. That's just what is the um, National Highway Freight Program funding portion. And then we added Ocean Dock Road that was truly multimodal. It touched everybody from the airport, from sea to air. It touches the port, it touches trucking, it touches rail. And so that was truly one of those multimodal connections that we heard loudly from the Freight Advisory Committee and the Statewide Advisory Committee of the importance of getting keeping that open and functioning for the entire state. That is where the goods come in. A state rail plan update and a truck parking study. And so this list had to be fiscally constrained. And so those are just the first projects coming out of it and then will continue to be updated. All right. And then really we go to the Freight Advisory Committee. So again, this is new in the new regulations. It is not a requirement. However, if you do have one, there are requirements. So USDOT strongly encourages each state to establish a statewide advisory committee. This is for collaboration, to be multimodal, to make sure all the interests are represented and that they're talking and coordinating for an efficient system. So the goal of it really is to have this collaborative forum, focus on statewide freight mobility issues and keep, keep goods moving. Again, it is not required, it is strongly encouraged. However, if you do set one up, there are legal requirements. So you're either, if you're in, you're all in. If you're out, you're out. So they do have a set of what the membership has to look like. It's fairly vague. This group meets that membership. You have to have general business and financial experience. You have to know something about freight and logistics or transportation planning. You have to represent members that represent the freight industry, state, local governments and MPOs, or represent the views of a community or nonprofit group. And also for Alaska, we've been talking to Eric and James and Judy, we want to include a tribal representative because that's an important piece of the Alaska culture. And so that is how this membership came forward for the Freight Advisory Committee. Many of you continued on, we had a few come in and out, but there are some certain requirements that have to be met. Questions, thoughts there? Pretty straightforward. Oops. Um, and then again, the roles for the Freight Advisory Committee moving forward will be to represent the freight industry, take a statewide perspective, 
really communicate, communicate and coordinate about your bottlenecks. We always think of bottlenecks in terms of trucking, but you know, the port has them, rail has them, and even aviation has bottlenecks or constraints. So really sharing those, working together, inform the state freight plan, the state investment plan, continue to provide recommendations for, for the roadway network on those critical urban and freight corridors, share information out to your organizations and solicit feedback to bring back to the group. And be forward thinking, looking to the future, future proofing the freight industry, what's coming next and how can DOT and the freight partners work together. So Eric, before we go on to the next slide, I know we've had some conversations about how we were gonna set up this Freight Advisory Committee and some of the different options. But before you answer that question, it looks like we had one in the chat. Do we have an unmanned aerial system representative on this? And I don't think that we do. So our drone pilots. I would recommend we pull Ryan Marlowe into this group because it's going to change the way freight works in the future greatly. And he's He's in touch with all of those pieces. He is the right person for that. You are correct. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. All right, Eric, did you want to just kind of give an update on what this could, how this freight advisory committee could be formally established? Um, sure. I think we have a, you know, there's a, a number of options. Um, and you know, I guess you, you look at it in terms of um, uh, longevity and permanence. Um, so one one option is uh, to continue sort of in the way we're doing doing it now, where um, you know we piggyback on top of the AMATS uh, Freight Advisory Committee for kind of a, a core set of membership, and then and then we add more members to it uh, to to give it a statewide focus. Um, the commissioner would be the, uh, you know, would be the authority for standing up that group. And um, so, you know, that would be much like it is now. It, it would be very much up to DOT to define um, um, in, in collaboration with the committee to, to define the, uh, uh, you know the t the terms for how people how long people serve and um, you know th those sorts of logistical things. Um, the the next option would be um, if you uh, if you raised it up to the governor level. We've done this with committees before, where the governor writes an administrative order uh, to establish the committee. Um, and that takes a little bit of work uh, legal wise, um, but it does get you something in in writing. Um, and then those appointments to the committee would be would probably be governed by uh, the boards and commissions. Um, and and we have committees, you know, in DOT that that operate on. Uh, on that basis, where boards and governors, boards and commissions are, uh, you know, are defining the the roles. Uh, the the third option would be um, if it was established in in uh, statute, um, or at least by law with the uh, with legislature, um, and that that of course takes a bit more work, and generally they want to point. Uh, they want to point to an authority for that, um, and so yeah, one of the one of the options there would be to have something in law um, that defined freight advisory committee as a responsibility for the commissioner. That's one way of doing it, um, and and then the, the the legislature would, you know, would enact some statute. Um, that uh, that defined what the role of uh, of the committee could be. 
and then it would be up to probably up to the department following that to write regulations governing how the how the committee operates. Um, so yeah, I think in the short term we continue as as we are because um, we we can continue to operate a state advisory committee under that vein. I, I guess it's really up to the committee. Um, how permanent they want to be and how, uh, um, you know, how, how much govern, government authority you want to have uh, to retain the permanence. It's always, it, it's usually a heavy lift in terms of, um, in terms of administrative order or statute uh, at the front end getting things going. Um, but then you have a you have greater permanence with a with a legal uh, justification for the group. So those those are basically your options. So any initial thoughts on that? I knew Joe, you'd raise your hand. A because you're just a really good committee member who participates a lot. So thank you. <laughs> I uh. I would caution the group to really kind of step back from that second and third option. Right now, it seems as if we have enough authority to make a freight plan, the organization to put every, you know, get everybody's input, successfully file our, you know, the intentions of freight in Alaska, but legislators are going to legislate. You don't want to turn this political. And even filing and becoming official boards and commissions turns things political. I think if you have the funding to keep, you know, the consultants paid and they can keep us in line, not being constrained by all the open meetings and all the official rules gives this committee, this community, a more accurate term, the freedom to, you know, continue doing what we're doing. It looks like we got through it just fine. Any additional barriers and handcuffs that we're willing to put on ourselves just to officially be scheduled on the boards and committee uh, commission's website and or you know getting into statute is just tying our hands further with uh politics and other uh things that would be in the way is my comments i see one thumbs up some other feedback on that And we also don't have to make a decision today. You can kind of send your thoughts uh, to me and we can kind of summarize those and send them on to the DOT team if you'd rather do that as well. But anyone else want to share some initial co thoughts or comments? Well, I started out not, not wanting to say anything, but I think Joe uh, kind of hit a nerve for me is, uh, you know, are we going to be even allowed to have that level of uh impact on on things that are happening you know if that's the case then uh, i like the idea of keeping it as a uh, you know as an informal group that uh, that gives advice to the uh to the commissioner uh, and not something that's got to uh you know we got to take minutes and we've got to publicly notice and we got to have quorums and on and on and on uh, you know, that tends to uh, provide a level of formality that does, in, you know, inject a lot of politics into this, whether we like it or not. And I will say we do publicly notice these meetings. So there is a public notice that does go out. So they are open to the public and they are noticed. And we do do nice meeting summaries. So it's transparent and at least posted on the, the freight plan update web page. Um, once that goes away, I'm not sure what would happen there with the with the meeting summaries and things. Hey, this is Mike with the uh, Tote Maritime. I support uh, what Joe and uh, and Steve uh, commented on. Thank you. All right, so probably what we'll and oh, Lee, quick, did you have something? Quick one. Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because Joe is super wise, right? He, he knows the game. He knows um, he knows the fluidity of the options. Um, however, 
the one benefit I see to the boards and commissions aspect, even though it does have a lot of strings attached to it, is that it solidifies the members. Um, it solidifies the the need and really the power of influence that advice brings. And I think it becomes a neutral area for big things, right? So like the port itself tying in um, maritime aviation and highways, um, it it forces sort of forces the department to listen a bit more uh, along lines of the advice. And and I see the benefit if it were to be under boards and commissions as opposed to um, advisory only and running kind of loosely is, and just checking the box. I think there's I think there is benefit. To an advisory board and maybe Robert um, has comments as well, just because he's gone through what the advisory board for the uh, Marine Highway system was able to accomplish in governance of the Marine Highway as well. <clears throat> Let's we'll go to Aaron an invitation first. to jump in. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. No, Robert, why don't why don't you respond and then we'll go to Aaron and Rich after that. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you know, nobody is incorrect. Um, I mean, those are all valid points through there, but you know, the you know, with the um, the the flexibility that comes with an ad hoc group comes the flexibility to set aside a lot of uh, the the thoughts and and um, and recommendations of an ad hoc group as well. Having some formality and having a record does provide a framework for um, for actions that get taken and that get reflected on and implemented. So, um, you know, I don't have a strong feeling either way. Um, we're like I said in the chat box, you know, we're we're all in for whatever direction we we want to go in as a group. But there are benefits to to structure that. Uh, you know, as 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 major funding decisions are being made, plans are being put in place that um, are, are having a more central place in how those funds are directed and, and generational investments are being made and how we move freight and transportation. Um, there there is definitely um, cause to reflect on those possibilities. So, you know, maybe we, we don't make a decision today, but it is worth contemplating. Thanks, Robert. Aaron, we'll go to you next. So just from my perspective, all we do at AMATS is formal everything. Um, we don't have really ad hoc, so everything has to be formal. So my questions come up if you want to do like a board and commission. Are you going to do bylaws? Are you going to do voting? You know, when does the agenda have to be posted? If you have an agenda, who's going to post it? Where is it going to be posted? Mm -hmm. um, when do we have to get the information to you? Is there a separate website for it? Where are you going to post the recordings? Where are you going to post the minutes? Who's going to take the minutes? Like. Boards and commissions comes with a ton of work that most people here may not have to do on a regular basis. So we at AMATS have to do it on a regular basis, and it takes a lot of time and effort. So if you can figure out who can do all that work, that'd be awesome. But AMATS staff isn't going to have the time to be able to do that. So um, I'm not going to volunteer my staff time, mine or John's, to do the boards and commission style work. So just a heads up from that. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Go ahead, Rich. And I think to the point that Joe was trying to make is this, if you go the formal route, um, by going the formal route to some degree, it gives it some, uh, some semblance of authority and it's an advisory committee. It's not supposed to have any sort of authority, but by going that formal route, there's a semblance of it. And if you have authority, somebody's gonna wanna use it. And that's, kind of against the idea of having a, a big boat, just advisory committee to give information to. I mean, we don't, there's no standing on the idea of what we can give information to, but it's advisory and it stays that way. I'm not sure the formal route would really be advisable for that. Thanks, Rich. Brian, Railroad Brian. Yay, Railroad Brian. Um, I agree as far as if we go the formal route, this is going to turn into, you know, has a potential of, of having, besides just the administrative problems and potentially the political problems, you know, a lot of us are on other boards and things like that, uh, whether it's AMATS, Freight Advisor, stuff like that, but you start 
tripping over rules like if three of us get together somewhere for something else, then what does that mean? Um, I I think going the formal route is just going to really ham hamstring the committee to the point of uselessness. Um, you know, we're advisory, we're advisory only. There's a lot of stuff the DOT has to do federally that you know some of us just have an inkling of, and to put it in more of a, a formal board thing, I think it's just, it's gonna be a mess. All right, so it looks like everyone kind of, was a great discussion. What I would recommend is everyone kind of just mull on it a bit more. We don't need to make a decision today. We can send out, Holly and I can send out kind of just a, a poll to take everybody's pulse and to see if you need additional information to make a final decision or if everyone is really leaning one way or the other, then we'll coordinate with Eric and the team at DOT on next steps there. So I would expect, you know, just kind of, well, Holly and I'll reach out in about two weeks, do your homework, think about it, talk to your friends, family, partners, whoever you need to talk to, and we'll um, kind of just take a pulse on everybody. James? Yeah, thanks. And this is this has been really super discussion. And, and I, um, I, I guess I, I'm going to reserve my opinion, but, but I, I think that that's the right approach is measuring all the, the different um, pros and cons from each of the options. And I guess the, the one thing I wanted to put out there is that, you know, it, we need to frame how we're thinking. It's not necessarily this this group is making the decision, but it's going to put together a recommendation. So as you're framing mm -hmm. your responses, Think about like why? Why would you vote? You know, go one way or another, so that all that can go into a good um, recommendation from this committee to you know the, the commissioner and, and commissioner's office and other folks that would be um, looking. Yeah, that's the yeah, exactly right. Getting getting that feedback from the commissioner's office is going to be critical. Um, so uh, that that's all I just wanted to add is you know that that we're not making a decision about which one we're taking, we're, we're putting a recommendation together. Correct, yeah. All right, so again, we'll follow up with some additional information. We'll, we'll, and kind of this informal polling, will sort of say, you know, what, what are your thoughts and why? So then James <laughs> and team can start to mull that over. All right, so before we kind of move on to the different project updates and, and what's been going on, I did want to, we will continue kind of in this same ad hoc role that we're playing now. Kit, Holly and I have been kind of retained to work with you, get the meetings advertised, set up, work on agendas, and if necessary, come up with bylaws, help appointing chairs and vice chairs, because that's still a good idea for a committee, because someday you may not have a consultant, and you may have to kind of run your own meetings with DOT. So we did want to talk a little bit. We were thinking about quarterly meetings for now. So just kind of does quarterly feel about right? Or do you feel like there's a need to meet more often in the next, just kind of looking six months ahead? Steve? Yeah, boy, I've, I've got a ton going on. Quarterly works for me. Okay. <laughs> Brian All right. agrees in the chat. All right. So we'll, again, we could kind of send out a new, James? Yeah, I mean, the, the context here is, is what are we, what are we gonna be talking about at each one of these meetings? I mean, if it's, if it's just meeting just to meet, then yeah, quarterly. One of the big things that um, you know I think still needs some work is the um, list of freight projects. That was largely a kind of mm -hmm. carried forward list um, that we still need to work um, through this committee to figure out. You know what is the process? Um, the those we talked about scoring criteria and evaluation process and all that stuff, and none of that's been done up to this point. Um, so, you know, getting a, a fiscally constrained list of freight projects is important to make sure that we are utilizing those funds. 
So and James, it, so agenda. under yeah, that ahead. under that scenario, we would probably want to meet and work through that before August, correct? If we're looking at the next budget cycle, so this will be SFY 25, then we need to be having those discussions over the summer. That's right. Okay. So knowing that, one thing that we talked about too is this meeting is really for all of you and to coordinate freight across the modes. So also looking to this group to help set the next meeting agenda and what would be included on that. And then Holly, myself, and DOT will, will get prepared and make sure that when you do come to a meeting, it's meaningful and it's a good use of time. So would like to kind of talk about some of those agenda items. I think James just put some nice ones out on the table. Any other topics that this group feels like needs additional discussion right now, or is it really the freight investment plan and, and projects where we need to focus next? I think the only other item that might be beneficial is and you've covered it before in the past, but kind of adding um, modal risk mitigation just as a discussion um, in in terms okay. of you know the port, the highway, all all of that access. Not sure where we'd go with that particular bullet point, but at least having DOT continually thinking of it and the municipality thinking of it is a, a positive benefit. Excellent. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, just uh, you know, one more you know, word of caution on on building a project list. Uh, there, you know, there are projects that are going to be necessary for the state's freight plan that involve modes of transportation that don't have a formulary. And what we can ill afford to do is not not put those on the list just because there's no steady stream of federal mo uh, money that's going to come in to help support the programs that are related to it. The fact of the matter is, you know, there is, you know, there has to be a recognition of everything that is freight related, whether, you know, FHWA is a big fan of it, or FAA is a big fan of it, or FRA is a big fan of it. Um, it still has to be on the list and recognized as an important part of this because someday we're going to have to come to that question well how are we going to handle this one too and and so far that hasn't been uh, you know you know in in my experience that has that has not been the the way we think in this state thanks steve and and i will say that in all of the projects that kind of you're referring to that maybe don't fall under those general federal formula formula programs that this group brought up are included in the illustrative list in the freight plan so they are at least captured there for future discussion and i think that's important to continue that go ahead brian um yeah just sort of adding on to Steve, I mean, the problem we've got, I mean, we've got a five, 10, 20 year program here that, you know, is 30, 40% non-federal, sometimes more. And the other, and we've got a lot of flexibility in so much as we tend to move stuff around into federal, out of federal as we can depending upon, you know, opportunities and situations that arise. Um, and so I, I think we can probably give you a list of projects. Well, I know we can give you a list of projects, but the problem we've got is the order of those projects and relative priority, um, I think is a little bit more fluid than what you generally see on, on a pure a pure federally funded DOT type um, system. And so how do you want to keep that current? Um, we need some guidance on that. 
Yeah, and I also think we want to remember the value of this advisory committee is making sure we're sharing those projects with each other and finding those synergies and those overlaps and maybe some opportunities to help one another out. So if everyone's developing their project lists without coordinating across the different modes, where is that overlap? Where's that creative funding mechanism if we're looking at the IIJA funds where we can we can do some port improvements a little bit outside if it's going to help trucking, if it's going to help aviation. So we may we may help DOT come up with their federally constrained you know, projects for the, the statewide transportation improvement program and freight plan. But we also want to make sure we know what every other mode is doing so that we can really maximize the benefit of those projects very much focusing on that multimodal. So I think that's where the importance of the discussion happens. And maybe that does change your list a little bit, Brian, maybe it changes Steve's list a little bit. Maybe we can find something that, you know, is mutually beneficial and we're able to advance one because you do have more flexibility. And I think that Ocean Dock Road hitting the, the uh, freight plan is one of the fiscally constrained projects is a really good example of that. That's where everyone came to the table and they said, this affects all of us. Let's let's make this a priority. Yeah, and then we get into the linkage, linkages part where we got to deal with Whitney Road because we can we can we can <laughs> yep. fix the upper end of the plumbing, but if you don't fix the lower end of the plumbing, you still have a mess. So. Right. So. Remember, that's why we're all sitting here. It's that value. It's making sure we're not all looking at our one mode and really being microscopic and we're putting our heads up and, and thinking a little bit more statewide and multimodal. Joe? Uh, I've, I've found some resources, but not a ton of resources. I think it'd be beneficial if, you know, we could find an actual list of grants and competitive grants that this new legislation did advance for, just so all the brains that are on this call can dink around and look through it and find ideas that might, you know, be beneficial. Because, I mean, you look to the STIP, you know that people make comments on the stip but you know originated any project on there originated out of somebody's bright idea and then it eventually got to be a good enough idea that if somebody kind of planned it out and then eventually got engineered and then it gets into the stip but getting a project from idea to creation uh it might be beneficial for all the folks in this group to have access to uh you know white papers on what the the new legislation can actually offer and things of that nature so a little bit more education on what competitive grants are out there uh, I think would benefit the, the group. Excellent. I can do that easily. I have that written up in, in multiple versions. All right. So it sounds like our next agenda will be to uh, risk mitigation, start to just talk about projects and process, and then sharing resources for grant and formula funding, because there's a lot of formula funding. And there's a lot more grant money. It's coming out very slowly from um, USDOT right now. So there's going to be a lot more grant funding coming forward. It's just taking a bit longer than everybody anticipated. So I think that's good news for everybody. It's not all awarded yet. There's still a lot of opportunity. All right. So with that, shall we go ahead and set kind of a next meeting date? Uh, it's it's May, and if we need to start helping DOT with some of the projects, I hate to do summer meetings, um, mid-June, that maybe a Friday afternoon in June. <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs> okay, no Friday afternoons in June. Uh, it's going to be snowing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the water will be too high for the fish run this year. So there you go. Um, yeah, so I think we'll probably we'll pick a date sometime in mid-June. We'll pick a Tuesday or Wednesday in case anyone wants to take probably a Wednesday. So you can take a long weekend on either end and we'll send out an invite for that. Sure. All right. 
And then we have, Holly, you've coordinated a lot of this. So we have some project updates. And yeah. go ahead. I wanted to say, let's kick it off. Yeah, so I invited um, Aaron and Jackson both to give a brief five minute approximately each verbal update on you know what's going on in the AMATS and the fast planning world. Um, I also invited um, the MATSU as they're in the early stages of develop or maybe they're like right in the thick of it of developing their MPO, although they're so busy they couldn't attend. Um, so but we do have, um, we'll start with Aaron. Why don't you give a brief update from the AMATS perspective? Hello everyone. Uh, so really quickly, some major things to look out for. We are in the middle of our 2050 MTP, our long range plan update. Uh, we've put together our list of projects based on feedback from the public and the committees, and we're putting it all together in one giant document. We hope at the end of summer, we'll be putting that out for a public comment period and kind of going through the approval process for that. So be on the lookout for that. Um, AMATS is also starting a safety or has started a safety plan for our area. So that's going to be taking kind of the vision zero work that was done and building upon it and getting a lot more specific uh, information as well as recommendations for improvement projects throughout our area that we can kind of take and put into our funding plan as time goes along, as well as make us eligible for the safe streets for all grant program because uh, we don't have an action plan yet. So that'll help us to meet that. Um, we're going to be starting a climate action plan here soon. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, that'll probably start within maybe six months or so. So we still got a little while, but just something to watch out for. And uh, well, recently, just another thing to note, we updated our public involvement software uh, to public input. So we're now doing everything through that. So we have kind of a consolidated location for all of our public involvement process. Um, as well as things like people can text us their comments or they can leave voicemails for their comments and we can integrate that into our uh, system and put it out as part of our public involvement process. So we're really excited for that. And um, yeah, we have a ton of other stuff going on, but uh, that's all I had. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, Jackson, go ahead. All right, thanks. So a few items in Fairbanks. Um, we've got a one new interchange under construction, which will be completed this year. This, that's at the Gaffney Airport, Richardson and Steese intersection at the main gate to Fort Wainwright. Um, construction began last year. Uh, this year it'll get completed, but it's a very large um, at grade uh, interchange. And then beginning next year, they'll be breaking ground on the Steese Johansson interchange project, which is actually grade separated. Um, and they have to build a temporary detour road from the Johansson Expressway up to Farmer's Loop. Um, that construction we expect to span about three years uh, worth of time. And uh, but in any event, there will be a detour route, uh, route around that road for the you know haul road trucks going up the Dalton Highway. Uh, to get around the intersection during during construction. Uh, some other notes here, uh, we're kind of deep into our um, transportation advisory committee meetings for the Kinross uh, ore hauling plan. Uh, our next meeting uh, will be held on May 16th from 9 a.m. to noon, so three hour meeting. These meetings are uh, open uh, to the public to listen into, uh, but of course that's a very hot topic for our region. Um, there has been some movement in the governor's budget to allocate some of the bridge funds uh, towards three bridges along the route uh, to get those to get those uh, uh, replaced and uh, and upgraded. Um, our focus from from the fast fast planning perspective is really taking a hard look at the preferred route uh, for the uh, trucks through our urbanized area uh, because there are a number of um, routes that we consider different alternatives that have different impacts. So we're going to be studying, studying that pretty heavily, uh, but we do expect uh, out of this transportation advisory committee at some point here this summer, um, a draft action plan that's released for public comment for you all to take a look at and, uh, and review. But it is a very long corridor from um, all the way out at uh, Tetlin along the Alaska Highway to Delta up along the Richardson to the Fairbanks North Pole area and then north of the Steese to the Fort Knox, Fort Knox mine. And then uh, just my last update here, 
Um, we did recently hold a call for project nominations for transportation projects that improve air quality. And there was one freight project nomination, uh, which is on uh, University Avenue uh, to replace the manual train switch as those trains wait to get into the main yard, replace that with an automated switch. So uh, that project scored very high um, underneath our process, and we are uh, working with uh, the railroad to try to get them an award uh, for that funding um, by June of this year. And uh, hopefully we can get that into design and that automated train switch can um, uh, uh, be constructed in uh, next summer. So those are my updates. Any questions for Aaron or Jackson? Okay. Um, the next time we meet, I hope to have a, a freight update from the Matt Sue. You're going to have uh, Eric give a quick update on DOT projects. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I. I just I just want to include the Matsu in the as they're in the process of developing their MPO. I I just think it's going to be an important element for us all here. So just plan for that next time. OK, Eric, you're up. Sorry, my pointer did a disappearing act. I'm going to defer to uh, Judy Chapman, who's here at the meeting. Um, and then I think James has some additional to add after Judy's done. Thanks, Eric. Go ahead, Judy. OK, yeah, sorry about that. I'm um, trying to get myself off mute. Yeah, we do have um, quite a few projects across the state that will impact freight, and some of them are you know, large projects that you're all aware of. I mean, there's, there's uh, of course, the Sterling Highway 45 to 60 that is scheduled to, it's in construction now, scheduled to finish up by 2029. Um, we have a plan underway to four lane the Seward Highway. Um, that's a transportation X project, and we're working on um, it under a CMGC. Uh, and I don't actually have the mile points or mile posts um, in mind right now, but um, that will be a, a big impact and, and uh, impact mobility on the Seward Highway. And then we've also got Seward Highway. Uh, O'Malley to Diamond going on. Um, the, the Parks Highway uh, Alternative Corridor and um, the Kinnick Arm Crossing question are, are floating out there. We have a Pell study, a planning and environmental linkage study that's looking at the Parks Highway Alternative Corridor. And I'm understanding that it's, you know, some of the concerns and questions are about perhaps uh, resurrecting the Kinnick Arm Crossing and eliminating the need for that. So there's there's that out there. We'll let you know how that progresses. Um, we do have a Sterling and Seward Y interchange HSIP project that's uh, starting to get some traction and should be underway next year. Um, and I think Someone had mentioned some of the bridges. I think that was Jackson, maybe. But there's um, the Robertson Johnson Gersel River bridges, China Slough Bridge, and also the China Hot Springs Bridge, um, which are all in design and some are in CMGC contracts currently. Um, then we've got the Glen Highway Long Lake reroute, which is still in design with uh, construction being planned for. Uh, several years out yet, and we we don't have a current stip, so it's hard to be very precise with construction dates. But we will be updating our stip over the summer, and we'll try to dial some of those in. Um, and then there's just some other ones that might be of interest. Um, you know, there's a Parks Highway Houston to Willow project that will be coming up, um, a Seward Highway and Alieska intersection improvements project. And that will be mostly of interest to local freight, I, I'm assuming. And then Sterling Highway uh, 157 to 169 reconstruction will have some passing lanes. Um, we've also got the Alaska Highway passing lanes that are underway right now. Um, and then we'll be upgrading the Glen Highway 53 to 56, the Moose Creek Canyon section. Um, that'll be a big you know, improvement in upcoming years as well. And I think I've got a couple others on the list, but I think that's probably the big ones that we've got that are, 
are going to be of interest to this group. Thanks. Any questions for Judy before we move on to James? OK, go ahead, James. Yeah, thanks. So I did want to um, there was a couple of items that Wendy brought up in the beginning um, that are we're actively working on, but I guess just more broadly, I wanted to talk about um, things that are more initiatives or or plant you know ways that DOT is that um, looking forward that um, it'd be great to get you know this is a great group to get some input on on some of those things and maybe we could you know add them to future agendas if there's interest. Um, one of those items is this move from kind of the, the traditional waterfall planning model to a more agile planning model. Um, this is new to, to pl the planning discipline in general, but also to transportation planning in particular, where things are very, very linear. We had a conversation with Wendy this morning about our long range transportation plan and that We've been working on that for the better part, you know, going on three years. So that baseline data, you know, by the time we get to the point where we're publishing it, how relevant is the, is the information that's in there? So the idea with agile planning is that we go, things are, are continuous, they're, they're iterative, there's deliverables that are constantly being produced, um, but it means it also stays relevant to the environment that we're operating in. So there's some practical pieces to that that we're working through, and we'll have to work um, with FHWA and FTA about what that means, contracting um, language, potentially stewardship and oversight language. Um, but that, you know, it's not just um, a, a plan that we do every five years and then we got to dust it off and start over again. It's we're we're always talking about this. Um, and we, we presented the same concept to Roads and Highways Advisory Board, and I think they had a good analogy that it starts to operate more like a business plan where it's more relevant, more real, more tangible. Um, so that there's some of that that would include some other things like new tools and techniques. Um, we're investigating an interactive um, series of plans where as opposed to like a flat document that you know has nice pictures and everything, but something that people can engage in and dive into, whether it's a a wiki or a whatever, something that that um, can help to you know build that engagement. Um, the other the uh, element that this group may find interest in, we've been working um, with the legislature. There's a lot of interest in uh, Senate transportation about starting to evaluate how to measure economic vitality in capital investment. Um, so we we presented a little bit of information. Um, we also got them in contact with the Virginia DOT, who is uh, they, they've got a whole army of data scientists and anyway, so so nothing quite so robust as that. But it's just starting to look at, you know, like what metrics are we looking at? What what um, evaluation criteria would we be looking at? Um, you know, things that that further freight, certainly, um, but, you know, counting jobs, counting economic impact. So that's something that we're, we're at the very kind of outset of starting to evaluate both with the state and the legislature that this group might be a good one to solicit and kind of talk through, you know, how to value um, economic vitality and bake that into some of our project selection processes. Um, a couple of the plans that Wendy mentioned in the beginning, we are actively working on. So if we're, there's an element that we need to integrate with this team um, or solicit input from this team, that'd be great. So a carbon reduction strategy, we have a requirement from the state to have that done, I, I think by August or September. So we got a very short window to get that first plan out. Um, so we're, we're kind of full full steam ahead trying to get that one. And the, the plan federally is, is mostly targeting greenhouse gas reduction, but we're gonna be thinking a bit more broadly um, and how we can um, you know improve uh, you, you heard sustainable transportation, um, how we can improve sustainable transportation across the state in, in general. Um, that it does include this idea of sustainable transportation as one of our focus areas, and you'll see that in the LRTP. Um, it'll also be kind of working its way into our programs. So um, the last one that I'll leave you with is um, we've been presenting to the Roads and Highways Advisory Board since um, last July on um, this idea that there are regulations, plan specifically planning, tr transportation planning regulations, are, are so out of date that it's hard to comport with them. 
it's also um, hard to uh, meaningfully evaluate projects because the regulations were tied to how the old federal rules worked. They were tied to things that were decades old. Um, so we're the proposal at this point, and after the last board meeting, we've got some work to do, is basically to, to do a regulations rewrite. Most of that means that those planning regulations would, would either be deleted or um, rewritten, uh, but that we would instead develop a strategic investment plan. Um, so without talking about this too much, we did some research and looked at, well, how are other states doing this? How are they able to stay current? Well, there, it's, a, it's a plan. I mean, it's very, it's a, one of these continuous plans that they're always updating that talks through how you categorize projects, how you evaluate projects, what criteria, how you allocate resources. Um, so the specific regulations we're looking at at this point are uh, 17 AAC 05.170. Dot 175 and dot 195. And generally, those are looking at project categorization, project evaluation, and funding distribution. Um, those regulations largely talk about CTP and TAP, kind of our public process, but we're going to be using this as an opportunity to, to talk about all of our, you know, how does the state make investment decisions? Um, and there's two, two strains there, right? There's the public process where we're putting um, RF RFPs out or uh, RFAs calling for projects. And then there's the data driven or data informed processes that the state uses to make decisions through boards and committees such as this, like with our freight plans. So if there's an interest in getting um, some more information or involvement on that strategic investment plan as that starts to get developed, uh, we could also bring that to this committee as well. And I've probably talked too long, so I'll stop. Thanks. That was perfect. Thank you. Any questions for James? OK. I think that's everything you had for today, Wendy. Yeah. That covers everything. So as always, you can uh, still reach out with questions, comments. Uh, we'll try to get some of the information out that's been requested. Joe had kind of a list. We'll send that out to all the committee members over the next week or so. And you will be hearing more from us and look for our next meeting date in June. I think it'll be pretty productive. We can discuss some of what James brought up as well. I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap in our topics. So with that, have a great rest of your day and thank you. Thank you everyone very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.